Thank you for joining me today as we study the Word of God, looking at highlights from the book of Hebrews. Today, we're gonna to talk about fixing our thoughts. In the third chapter of Hebrews, verse one, the writer tells us, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. We're gonna talk about the power of fixing our thoughts. The way we think determines the way we live. Emerson, the noted author said, a person is what they think about all day long. The book of Proverbs reminds us as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. When you change the way you think, you will change the way you live. So the writer of Hebrews tells us, therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest, whom we confess. What a powerful verse of scripture packed full of insights for living. And the rest of this chapter of chapter three shows us the benefits of fixing our thoughts. Well, first of all, let's ask the question, what does it mean to fix our thoughts? Well, the word fix and thoughts is only one word in the Greek language of the New Testament. And it means to consider, to take special notice of something and to perceive clearly. So fixing our thoughts is about taking time to ponder the mysteries of something, to think about all the implications of the truth, to think it through. It also means to keep our minds focused on that truth rather than getting distracted. You know, James tells us in James chapter one, verse eight, a double-minded person is unstable in everything they do. Well, the double mind is the inability to keep the mind focused on the right thing. So fixing our thoughts is about focusing on something, to think about it, to look at it from every angle, to perceive it clearly for what it really means and not to assume that we know what it means, to consider something, to ponder something, to take special notice of it. He says, I want you to fix your thoughts on Jesus. To perceive correctly who Jesus really is. You know, a lot of religions mention Jesus. All the major religions in the world include Jesus at some level. Islam, which came 650 years after Christ, sees him as a prophet. Muhammad borrowed many of his ideas from the Bible. Buddhism, Hinduism, the Eastern religion see him as an avatar or an enlightenment, a Buddha. You see him in New Ageism today. The Christ within you, the ideal person. Well, they see Jesus, but they don't see him clearly. They don't perceive the full wonders of who he is. And sometimes we see something in the Bible that we read. But if we were to take a little more time to think about it or study it or continue to think about it, we would see it more clearly. We would come to understand it. And all of us have had that experience. And I trust that as we study the scripture together, that that happens to you as we take time to, to look at some of these concepts in the word of God, that the Lord will reveal himself to us through the scripture. Sometimes we read the Bible so fast that we don't perceive clearly what we're reading. We don't take special notice of it. There are many things in the Bible that we need to slow down and take more special notice of certain passages that are filled with incredible truths. So to fix our thoughts means here to perceive something correctly, to focus on it, take special notice of it, to ponder it, to think it through. Now thought control enables us to control our lives. As we think, we live. Now Paul talks about this when he was in prison. I've been in a lot of prisons, state and federal. I've gone in many times and performed concerts and preached the gospel with our team. And if I was in prison, I'll tell you, all you can think about is the distractions of prison, the place, the officers, the stress, the danger. So he was in prison. But instead of focusing on the injustice that was shown to him when he was put there because he preached the gospel, he didn't commit any real crimes. He was a spiritual and religious person persecuted for the gospel. He could have focused on that and just been mad and bitter. 
He could have wondered why God abandoned him and allowed him as a great apostle to be put in jail, but he didn't do that. He fixed his thoughts on Jesus. He wrote many of the great letters of the New Testament from prison. And many scholars believe that he is the author or at least the mind behind Hebrews. And I share that view based on the content of Hebrews. In Philippians 4, verse 8, he said to us, write it out of prison to us, not in prison. He said to fix your minds and thoughts on the right things. He said, whatever is true or noble or right or pure or lovely or admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Think on these things. Same concept. Don't let your mind wonder about all the distractions of life or the deceitful things of life, the defeating things of life. But whatever is true and noble and right, whatever is pure and lovely and admirable, whatever is excellent and praiseworthy, think, fix your thoughts on these things. And he says, the God of peace will be with you. You find great peace when you think about the right things. And so here today, we're considering the power of fixing our thoughts. We're able to govern our emotions. We're able to better make decisions when we fix our thoughts on the right things. We'll have greater peace. Our minds won't drift into everything that worries us if we fix our thoughts. Well, the second question is, what should we fix our thoughts on? Well, he tells us in terms of our faith that our faith is focused on Jesus, the person of Jesus and the work. And he calls them by two titles, the apostle and high priest, whom we confess, the confession of our faith. Well, the word apostle means someone sent with a mission. Now, Jesus, the apostle, the one sent from God on the mission to redeem the world from sin is greater than the apostles he appointed. He appointed 12 of all those disciples that traveled with him to be his apostles. They, and he sent them out on a mission to represent him. And those apostles were the leaders of the early church and were indebted to them for their faithfulness to Jesus and how they preserved the Christian faith. In fact, the Bible says of the early church in Acts 2 and 42 that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching because they were giving to us the word that Jesus taught. And that's why we have the New Testament. It comes from apostolic authority. But it doesn't focus on the apostles. It focuses on Jesus. He becomes the focal point of our faith, the apostle. We're not the followers of the apostles. We're the followers of Jesus. We're not the church of the apostles, we're the church of Christ. He's the greatest apostle because he came with the ultimate purpose to save the world and to redeem the world. And the Christian faith of a believer's life is only focused on the person of Jesus. We don't even focus our faith on the church. The church is the body of Christ. We love the church, we're part of the church. But the church in and of itself can't save us and joining the church can't save us as important as church membership is. It is only looking to Jesus, the head of the body of the church, the savior of the world. And so our faith, most importantly, must always be focused on Jesus. Now, the writer of Hebrews comes back to this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, and he says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. In verse 3, he says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you do not grow weary and lose heart. As a Christian, I encourage you to always focus your faith on Jesus. He never changes. Hebrews 13 and 8 says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I point this out because many things in your life are going to change. And sometimes we as Christians disappoint each other. That's why we don't look to each other. We're only human. We're all sinners saved by grace. Sometimes churches make mistakes. Churches are made up of people. And people get mad at the church and quit going to church. Don't quit going to church. You're part of the church. Churches are imperfect too. They're made up of people. We can learn to live with each other and love each other if we can face our own imperfections. But above it all, we're looking to Jesus. He never changes. He's the imperfect one, the perfect author of our salvation. We're imperfect. Christ is perfect. So fix your thoughts on Jesus. 
And when you get discouraged by imperfect people, don't let that be the source of your faith. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Forgive others, accept others, realize you make the same mistakes, but keep your faith focused on Jesus. And when other people mention some philosophy or some other religion, don't get distracted by all of that. Those things come and go. Jesus remains. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. He's the apostle. He's the one sent with the ultimate mission to save the world from his sins. And he says he's our high priest. Well, he interceded for our sins at Calvary. And he intercedes today for our salvation. Hebrews 7 and 25 says that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. Think of that. Jesus is always for you. He's always in your corner. He's always interceding for you. Do you recall the night that he had the Last Supper preparing for the cross? And Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death if necessary. Jesus said, you will deny me. What did he tell the disciples that night according to Luke chapter 22, verse 21 through 23? He said, Satan has asked to have you, to sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have returned, strengthen your brothers, he told Peter. You're going to have a letdown. He said, you're going to have a failure. You're going to deny me. But Peter, I prayed for you in advance. And I know that you're going to come through this failure. Return back to me. Be restored in your faith. And then you're going to be a blessing to others. And that same Christ intercedes for us. When you fail, when you go off rail, you take the wrong turn, Jesus intercedes for you. He's there to bring you back, to restore you, give you a new opportunity. Well, he tells us to fix our thoughts on Jesus as we consider the person and the work of Jesus. We gain a deeper understanding of him. I think this is why reading the story of Jesus and his teachings are so important. You know, Paul made a statement in his letter to the Philippians. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture that means a lot to me and it really is, I would say, a personal goal for me spiritually. Philippians 3.10, he said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. I find that a fascinating statement because he did know Christ. He met Jesus face to face on the Damascus road. But he said, I want to know him. What did he mean by that? I want to know him more fully, more completely. I want to understand at a deeper level what the Son of God really accomplished for me when he came into this world. The Amplified Version of the Bible embellishes on what he really meant. He said, I want to know Christ. I want to understand more fully, more clearly the wonders of his person. That is the pursuit of every Christian. And the more you fix your thoughts on Jesus, the more you'll take time to read the parables, the stories, the miracles, and certainly the mystery of his sufferings on the cross. I don't know if you know this or not, but if you take Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you were to just count up the sheer content of the literary content, about 50% of it is on the last week of his life when he went to Jerusalem, did those great teachings in the city, was arrested, went through the trial of King Herod, of the high priest, died on the cross, rose again. 50% of all the content of the four gospels deals with the last week of Jesus' life. It focuses on the atonement of Christ. It's very important to always read that and pray that God would help us to gain new insights into who Jesus is and what he has accomplished for us. Well, the third question we want to ask is, why should we fix our thoughts? I think we've already learned a lot about that today because the way we think determines the way we live. But there are two important reasons given here in the third chapter of Hebrews why we should fix our thoughts on Jesus. First of all, because of who we are in him. He calls us holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling. Now, three words are important to describe you and me as Christians. We're holy, we're sharing something, and we have a calling. The word holy means special, unique. We're not holy in and of ourselves. I'm uncomfortable with that word. I'm sure you are too. Holiness belongs to God. But when we repent of our sins and we're forgiven of our sins, we're holy. We're set apart for his sacred service. We're unique. We're special to God. 
We're a holy people. And we share. That means we've, we partake of something. You know, when we celebrate Holy Communion, we talk about partaking of the bread. When we eat a meal, we partake of something. Well, we share our common faith. You and I have the same faith in Jesus. We're part of the same family of God. We share something in common spiritually. And we share a calling. He says it's a heavenly calling. It's heaven that calls us to Christ. It's, it's heaven that speaks to us. It's when God breaks into our world and reveals Jesus to us and he calls us to himself. And that's why we should fix our thoughts on Jesus. We're not people of this world anymore. We've, we've been saved out of this fallen world. We live in the world to be a witness to the world. That's why we don't follow culture. We follow Christ. Culture's always changing. Culture's as confused as it's ever been. We don't follow the world. The world is groping in darkness. The blind are leading the blind. We follow the word of God. We're holy. We belong to him. We share an eternal life together. We have a heavenly calling. We're about bigger things and better things in this world. And because of who we are, because of the calling of God on our lives, we don't let our minds get distracted by everything in the world. We can fix our thoughts on Jesus. And with it, all the benefits and blessings of the promises of God that come with who Jesus is. And second of all, we need to fix our thoughts on Jesus and keep our thoughts on him because it keeps us faithful to him. Now, the writer of Hebrews makes this point in verses 12 through 14. He says, see to it, brothers and sisters, speaking to us as Christians, see to it that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold to our original conviction firmly to the very end. Well, he says we need to fix our thoughts on Jesus so that we don't end up drifting away, becoming unfaithful, having a sinful, unbelieving heart to turn away from the living God. But he said you should encourage one another daily that you and I, as I'm sharing with you today, encouraging you, you and I should be encouraging people to fix their thoughts on Jesus. When they get distracted, when they get deceived, when they get discouraged by things, point them back to Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. It is true. The way we think determines the way that we live. And the greatest thought, the most noble thought, the healthiest thought is to fix your thoughts on Jesus. Thank you for joining me today for this rich study of the book of Hebrews. I want to encourage you to follow me on social media. Let's stay connected together. Also, go today and subscribe to my sermon podcast if you haven't done so already. You can just listen to these teachings sometimes as an audio recording, maybe just driving to work. You can play the podcast, get your Bible study in that way if you, if you miss the video session sometimes. And always share these sermon podcasts and messages with others. The podcast, just go to your digital music outlet, iTunes, Apple, Spotify, whatever you use, and just look for David Cooper, Pastor David Cooper. Just hit subscribe and always share the Word of God with others as well. Mount Perrin is a great church because of your faithfulness and your partnership and because of the blessings of God. I want to thank you for your partnership and ministry for your generous financial giving to help support the ministry of the church in Atlanta, our missions around the world, our media that reaches all over the world, bringing the gospel of Christ and the word of God. Thank you for your partnership and ministry. I look forward to seeing you this Sunday for worship and pray you'll have a blessed day.